So good afternoon everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you in this second webinar. We started this this new product, teaching product at the European School of Urology and we're really happy with the attendance of the first one and really, really happy right now with the number of people that you we see that uh, is going to attend this one. So now no more introductions. I hope you will enjoy it. As a director of school, I'm really happy to be here. And now it's over to Marco. So please go ahead. Well, it's a very good evening and a great pleasure to have this opportunity. What we're going to discuss this evening is interpreting a urodynamic study. So my name's Marcus Drake. I've spent many years working in urodynamics, and it's a pleasure to be working this evening with Thomas Dutton, who's one of my colleagues, and he has the privilege of attending to the questions that people can send in during the course of the webinar. Now we're going to discuss the interpretation of a urodynamic study. We need to deal really with fact because this is a very important aspect of somebody's life is getting their diagnosis correct. But the trouble with urodynamics is that quite often there's artifact. Something goes a bit wrong. And if this isn't attended to, identified, then a wrong decision might be made. So what we'd like to discuss this evening, who should be having urodynamic tests? Which patients? What are the features on a trace that confirm it has been done well? And then how could the diagnosis be got wrong as a result of artifacts? Now, I work in a well-established center in the University of Bristol. The Bristol Urological Institute has been doing urodynamics for many years. And you can see that we have a large and very well-motivated team and we're privileged to be recognized by the EBU as a certified center. So the background is many years, and Professor Abrams, who's in the back next to Hashim Hashim, who's the director of the unit. Well, the three of us are the consultants for the unit, and we work hard in ensuring the quality is absolutely first class. And what we really feel is the importance when somebody attends for a urodynamic test is making sure that this is somebody who is genuinely bothered by their symptoms. That he's had or she has had sensible treatment recommendations already. For example, pelvic floor muscle exercises for stress incontinence or an antimuscarinic drug for overactive bladder. These should have been done because if those alone sorted out the symptoms, there wouldn't be need for any further intervention. And of course, an extra consideration, we might be contemplating surgery. So if this person is not actually medically fit for surgery, it doesn't really make sense to undertake a urodynamic study. So the point about urodynamic testing is really to decide what operation would be suitable. So we need to understand what this person's urinary tract problem is and recognize that there might be several problems at the same time, each of which needs to be considered. We need to think what treatments might be suitable for such a presentation. And then finally, we need to know whether there might be a risk factor for a bad outcome. For example, if we identify that somebody has difficulty passing urine, voiding dysfunction, but of course, stress incontinence surgery might make that worse. And that could mean that somebody ends up unable to pass urine as a result of stress incontinence surgery and therefore potentially extremely unhappy. Now, within our EAU guidelines, there are some specific suggestions as to the role of urodynamics during the diagnostic pathway. So for women, well, urodynamics really comes in inevitably if there are symptoms of an overactive bladder, if the person has had pelvic surgery in the past, or if the doctor suspects there might be some form of voiding difficulty. It's essential that this urodynamics is done in all these individuals, but arguably urodynamics should be used for the majority of women presenting for surgical consideration. The male LUTs guidelines, these focus on a group of people 
where it's really not clear whether voiding symptoms relate to bladder outlet obstruction or detrusa underactivity, a weak bladder contraction. So we might think about urodynamic testing if there is a substantial post-void residual. Or in the very old men, or alternatively the very young men, because there seems to be a higher prevalence of detrusor underactivity in each of those groups. Finally, of course, some people simply can't manage to pass more than 150 mils, and that makes it quite hard to interpret that person's voiding function. Before somebody comes for a urodynamic test, there are some very sensible measures that we should put in place to get the basis of this person's presentation. A free flow test, a bladder diary, ideally a symptom score, and a dipstick urinalysis to exclude red flag diagnoses such as malignancy or urinary tract infection. It's always good practice ahead of attending for a diagnostic test to be given an information sheet just so that people can have some knowledge of what to expect. Of course, on the day of a urodynamic test, I think we're pretty conscious that quite a lot of patients are rather nervous. And in fact, sometimes they're almost frightened. And that's mainly because they don't really know what to expect and they're imagining something worse than the reality. Now, because of that, when we see a patient, we tend just to give them about 10 minutes, having a conversation, just going over the specific aspects and just really reassuring the person that, in fact, this is not going to be as bad as they imagine. So the doctor, there we have the seat for the doctor on the right, uh, and a few information leaflets are available and a consent form. Then the patient will sit on the left and for about 10 minutes just go over all the aspects to make sure that the patient is happy and that there's complete clarity about the presentation. So with this 10 minute chat, we can ensure that it's a nice calm atmosphere. We can convey that we are actually caring and considerate. We can check the history and of course what treatments have been done in the past. The key symptoms, what bothers the patient most? And a symptom score is the best way of establishing that. And then, of course, go through the bladder diary. Now, the sort of symptoms that you might want to use, the International Consultation on Incontinence questionnaires are very good because they cover about 20 questions, ensuring that all lower urinary tract symptoms are properly considered. Weighing each one according to its severity and its bother associated with that particular symptom. So here we've got three of the 20 questions for a man, and it's very obvious that the most bothersome aspect of this person's life is the sudden need to rush to the toilet. They do sometimes have a sensation of incomplete bladder emptying, but only a low bother associated with it. And therefore, our assessment must focus on their overactive bladder. Now, bladder diaries, these are a fundamental means of really getting good insight. They give us a range of information, the fluid intake, the urine output, the total volumes voided during the entire period of 24 hours and overnight, the use of pads or perhaps catheters or other aspects, and helpfully when it comes to the urodynamic testing, the biggest voided volume because that's a sensible guide as to how much fluid it will be safe to put into this person's bladder. Putting in more than their biggest voided volume is likely to be uncomfortable and perhaps unrepresentative. Now the ICIQ has developed a validated diary using terminology understood by patients. Generally it's rec recorded over three days Here's an example of two days from a three-day diary. And what we can see here, well, the first thing to note, as mentioned, the biggest voided volume, 300 mils. So note that for the urodynamic test. Additional information, well, on the urgency score, basically they've got excellent control and no great urgency, 
and that means that they don't have an overactive bladder. We see that they need to self-catheterize and they do so on this particular day three times. Finally, the sort of fluid that they drink, well, it's very much dominated by coffee. Now, that doesn't matter for somebody with no overactive bladder symptoms, but it would do and would be a sensible starting point for treatment would be to reduce coffee intake if this was an OAB patient. Now, when it comes to running a urodynamic test, the most important informative body that's really decided how best these tests can be run is the International Continent Society. And their Good Urodynamic Practices document, published in 2002 under the lead authorship of Werner Schaefer, really sets out modern day urodynamic testing. And this has recently been reviewed. So, as a starting point, People usually attend with a relatively full bladder so that they can do a free flow rate test. It's a chance for us to look at a urinalysis and exclude hematuria or current infection because that would put us off undertaking a urodynamic test if there's active infection present. We need to check the voided volume, the post-void residual and the maximum flow rate. And of course, the pattern of flow is essential. Now, the maximum flow rate is an interesting property because what you will find with a conventional urodynamic machine is it will tell you what the maximum flow rate is. But in this example, it's telling us that the maximum flow rate is 29 mils per second. But that clearly comes at the top of this enormous spike. And that spike is an artifact in which this man has compressed his penile urethra with his index finger and thumb, occluding the flow altogether, and then releasing abruptly, giving this spike in which the elastic recoil of the urethra generates an unnaturally extreme flow rate. So it's quite important to be very cautious about overinterpreting what the machine tells us by way of maximum flow rate. We need to eyeball the trace, check it ourselves, and confirm we believe that it's a genuine flow rate, not artifactually influenced. So after the free flow rate comes the conventional invasive urodynamic test. This involves measuring abdominal pressure, and that can be done through the anus or the vagina. We also, of course, have to measure bladder pressure, which generally will be urethral, but could be suprapubic. We use a computer which runs all the time, subtracting the abdominal pressure from the vesicle to give us an impression of what we call detrusor pressure. In other words, the generated force from the muscle of the bladder wall. We use a separate channel in which to put fluid into the bladder so we're not waiting an excessive long time. And we ask the patient to report sensation as we fill the bladder up and then we give permission to void at which time they attempt to pass urine enabling us to measure pressure and flow. During the filling we undertake provocation tests. These are trying to reproduce those symptoms that the patient reported to us during the initial 10 minute chat. Now there's an important technical point we need to place these catheters, catheters into the rectum and into the bladder, and we need to be measuring pressures using pressure transducers. And of course, if an air bubble is stuck in the transducer or the tubing, the pressure of the patient's abdomen or bladder will be damped down by the air bubble. And so we need to flush any air bubbles out of the way. So here is the setup. On the left-hand side, the p -Vez in blue has a syringe attached and there's a three-way tap open from the syringe to the pressure transducer just underneath and another three-way tap going to the patient's catheter. By simply squirting saline from the syringe, we can expel any air bubbles. 
Now, an important technical point which is got wrong by a very large number of centers is the zeroing. Now, here you can see there's an arrow point to set zero all. Now, what that means is that pressing that, clicking that button will result in all pressures dropping to zero. Now, that should only be done when the pressure transducer is connected to the atmosphere. And so this time, the three-way taps on the vesicle pressure line have been turned so that the syringe is no longer connected to the transducer. The catheter just below the transducer is likewise disconnected. Instead, it's the open channel pointing towards the left that is connected to the transducer. It's then appropriate in that position to click set zero all and that's the effect of clicking that button. The red, the blue, and consequently the green all drop to zero. And they do that when we're recording atmospheric pressure. It's very easy to tell when that's been done simply by looking at a conventional trace. So here we have a trace in which the start on the extreme left-hand side the vesicle pressure is zero, the abdominal pressure is zero, so this has been zeroed to atmospheric pressure, and then when it's been opened to the patient, the catheters connected to the transducer, you can see that within the patient's abdomen is a certain pressure, which in this case is about 20 centimeters of water. A very similar pressure is present in the bladder. So here is the resting pressure of the bladder and of the abdomen. They're very similar, so they subtract out and therefore the detrusor pressure is close to zero. That's an essential requirement for International Continence Society recommendations. Zero to atmosphere so that we can see resting pressures within the patient which are above zero. Additional quality control. We always get the patient to do coughs regularly during the study, and we're looking to see that the height of the spike caused by the cough is very similar in the blue and the red line. So in this particular cough test indicated, they're quite similar. Perhaps the red line is not quite as high, which means that there is a little bit of upward spike on the detrusor line but not enough to be unduly concerned. We're reasonably happy with the result of this cough test. But look at this. This is the point at which the patient passes urine, and we need to know what is the pressure during voiding. So we get them to do a cough straight after the void to make sure that pressure recording is accurate during voiding. And in this case, we can see that the cough test is clearly not subtracting well. The blue line has almost failed to pick up the cough, and as a result, we've got great doubt about the truth of pressure recording during voiding. And that would be an artifact which could cause us great difficulty if we didn't spot that that has happened. Then, of course, we need to try to provoke symptoms. So here we've marked the series of coughs that is needed generally to reproduce stress incontinence. It's quite rare for a single cough to cause incontinence, but it can do. Here we've asked this lady to cough a few times, and what do we see? A little bit of leakage. So this lady has got stress urinary incontinence, and it's caused by urodynamic stress incontinence. Now, another situation that can occur during the filling phase is detrusor overactivity. And this is a change in detrusor pressure which may be spontaneous or provoked. So here we've got part of a filling phase. This time the detrusor pressure is plotted in purple, the bladder pressure is still in blue, and abdominal pressure in red. And at this particular point, you can see that there is a small increase in detrusor pressure. This is true detrusor overactivity. 
even though it's relatively small in amplitude, it is still clinically significant. It's quite important when you see that on a detrusor line to just look at the bladder and rectal line at the same time just to check that there is a change in bladder pressure going upwards, that it's not actually any drop in rectal pressure because that can look quite similar but is of course nothing to do with detrusor overactivity. So this truly is detrusor overactivity in this case because you can see the only feature associated with the change in detrusor pressure is a rise in vesicle pressure. Now, of course, detrusor overactivity can be associated with incontinence. So here we've got another example where a person has had very substantial overactive detrusor contraction, very powerful, 100 centimeters of water, and that has been associated with a flow of urine. So this is detrusor overactivity incontinence. It looks extremely similar to this. But this follows the particular instruction clearly labeled here, permission to void. So in fact, this is where the person was passing urine. Now this is an important point. We need to make sure that all urodynamic traces are nicely labeled so that somebody looking at this trace on a future date can clearly pick up what has gone on during a test. Because without the labeling, you cannot really tell, in some cases, the difference between an actual intentional void and detrusor overactivity incontinence. Let's think about the voiding phase then. This is a man who, on the left-hand side, filling phase shows some detrusor overactivity, and then at this stage, he said that he could really do with emptying his bladder, so we've given him permission to void. And here, we're recording the bladder pressure, rectal pressure, detrusor pressure, and flow. Now, with men, we're often trying to decide whether there's bladder outlet obstruction, and we can use a nice simple equation, P det Q max minus 2 Q max. This is called the bladder outlet obstruction index. And if there's any value above 40, that would be an obstructed patient. So let's think about the parameters for this man. Here's the Qmax, seven. Now I'm very specific. It's this curve because we should always ignore spikes. It's incredibly rare for a spike to be natural, as we saw in that free flow rate test earlier. So this is the corrected Qmax. Of course, the machine doesn't have the intelligence to correct, so it's picked up the spike as the maximum flow rate, and so it's going to get the calculation wrong, which won't make a huge difference in this case, but sometimes it will. So at the same time as the maximum flow rate, we're interested in this, the detrusor pressure at maximum flow. Now what we can see with very good eyesight, you can see that the detrusor pressure at maximum flow was 87. The actual corrected maximum flow was 7, and therefore the bladder outlet obstruction index was 73. 87 minus 2 times 7. So this man's clearly got bladder outlet obstruction. But let's really emphasize, if your machine is left unchecked and you simply accept what it says, then quite often you'll find that you get an erroneous bladder outlet obstruction index, which in some cases may make a substantial difference to your decision making. Now here is another example, but this time it's a woman. She's been given permission to void there on the left hand side, and as you can see, the flow is very interrupted. It takes an extremely long time about five minutes for her to empty her bladder with rather high bladder pressures associated for a woman. So we'd be very suspicious that this represents bladder outlet obstruction, but we must check. We always should ask this woman, is that typical 
for you? Do you always take quite so long to pass urine? And of course, compare with the free flow rate test that she did at the start of the study, just to be confident that it's not the process of a catheter in her urethra that actually led to this artifactual change in flow rate. So if we're reviewing a trace of a test done by somebody else, we've got to look for some key features. Is it a good quality test? Can we see the patient's urinary function? The provocation tests? Are there any artifacts? What do we have to get from the report? So here's an example. So this is a urodynamic trace of a woman with stress incontinence symptoms. First of all, what are the features of a good quality test? Well, as I mentioned, you must zero to atmosphere, and that's clearly the case. You must see resting pressures in abdomen and bladder, and that's clearly demonstrated. You've got to see cough tests to be confident that pressures were picked up accurately and equivalently in the two measured pressures, bladder and abdomen. You want to see a cough just before voiding. And again, a cough after voiding, so that you can be sure pressures were recorded during the voiding phase nice and accurately. And then finally, it's very helpful to see labeling so you can be confident you know exactly which phase and what happened. Secondly, you want to look at the features of the patient's urinary function. So, first of all, we've done a provocation test to look for stress incontinence, a series of coughs, and in this case, you can see in the flow rate, nothing shows up, and therefore, we've not seen stress incontinence just simply with a series of coughs. So then what's been done is the patient has been asked to stand up and jump around and do star jumps and much more strenuous exertion in order to try to reproduce the symptom of stress incontinence. And of course, if they're jumping around, they're not above the flow meter. So you can't look at the flow trace. You've got to look directly at this woman's perineum during this sort of test. Finally, we've got a nice demonstration of voiding with an excellent pattern of flow, peak flow, and appropriate associated pressures. Then we've got a nice bladder capacity. 419 mils is a perfectly adequate volume. No alarms from that volume. Finally, are there any artifacts visible? Well, this study is a good quality one, but you can actually see that there is a negative detrusor pressure at that point, and that is slightly artifactual, but potentially no great clinical implication for this particular individual. But let's remember, artifacts can sometimes cause very substantial problems. So as illustrated by the flow rate we looked at earlier. And then we also looked at this absent pressure generated by the detrusor during voiding, which we ascertained was down to the fact that the bladder pressure was not recording accurately. It probably got blocked as the catheter shifted during the void. And so you saw a very weak response in the bladder catheter to a cough. Now, another thing is sometimes detrusor overactivity can be misinterpreted. So in this study, you look at the green line and you see a small change in pressure. You might think that was detrusor overactivity. But when you see the blue line is absolutely flat, you should click, no, it's not detrusor overactivity. There's no bladder contraction happening with this. It's actually a drop in rectal pressure. And that becomes incredibly obvious during the series of coughs, the rectal pressure drops a lot and gives the impression of quite a substantial change in detrusor pressure. But in fact, that's erroneous. It's not a detrusor contraction. It's a drop in rectal pressure. Now, of course, some things 
you absolutely have to rely on what is written in the report. And it's very valuable if the report after a urodynamic test is very specific whether the symptoms that the patient is complaining of in their day-to-day -day life were actually seen during the test. If they weren't, then you've got to be cautious in interpreting that test. So was it a representative, typical urinary cycle for the patient? And were there any problems during the test? So to draw to a conclusion, we've discussed a few key aspects of interpreting a urodynamic study. We've discussed who should have urodynamic tests, what are the features of a trace that confirm a study has been done well, so zeroing to atmosphere, seeing resting pressures present, a nicely labeled trace with regular coughs and provocation tests. And we've also considered what artifacts might lead to a wrong conclusion on diagnosis. So that draws this particular webinar to a conclusion bar a few questions which I hope people will have been able to send in. But of course, if you missed the previous webinars, they are available for you. They've been recorded and been put on the European School of Urology website. And we're looking forward to another webinar next month, which will be led by Professor Alexander Govorov. So please follow us on at EuroWebESU, our Twitter account, where you can see all future developments of ESU initiatives. And now, Tom, I hope we have some questions which have been sent in to us. Okay, thank you very much. There's we've got several questions to get through, if that's okay. The first one I've got is from um, Pauline MacDonald, who works in Lancashire Teaching Hospitals in the UK. And she'd like to know if, that if a patient presents with typical symptoms of OAB, would you consider urodynamics before medication? I think um, that's a good question, but we do have a, a very important protocol of ensuring that conservative measures are done before going to urodynamics. For example, the fluid advice, the bladder training. And I think most guidelines would encourage the use of antimuscarinic medication and in many countries, myribegron, before proceeding to urodynamic testing. Because if the patient is happy and well controlled with medication, then they're really not going to need any invasive testing or treatment. Okay, thank you. Um, a second question from Dr. Tanadir in Turkey um, is to do with urodynamics and neurogenic bladders, um, especially those with uh, DSD. Um, and he'd like to know what the volume and or detrusor pressure is, which is the critical threshold for us to um, finalize a urodynamic evaluation. And I, and I, I get from that what, what what the limit is for risks to the upper tract? Yeah, I think that's, that's actually a very difficult question because there's no real confident professional consensus on that. So the diagnosis of detrusor sphincter dysinergia is basically that there is an uninhibited sphincter contraction during an overactive detrusor contraction with flow. So you see a typical hydromechanical pattern of uh, pressure chain and interruptions of flow, and the absolute pressures can actually get very high. But the specifics of which pressures and what pattern of DSD results in renal damage, we don't really have reliable information. So I'm afraid I, I can't answer that question because there isn't any professional consensus. Okay, thank you. And um, on a slightly different line, Dr. Gomez, I'm afraid, don't know where Dr. Gomez works at the moment, but thank you, Dr. Gomez, for your question, um, has asked, could you make some comments on the leak point pressures and how we may interpret them? Yeah, so leak point pressures, there are two fundamental types. So there's abdominal leak point pressure in which somebody generates a valsalva to a certain level. If they don't leak, then they'll generate a more forceful valves alpha contraction and keep on going until stress incontinence results. Now, the difficulty with that is controlling the, um, the pressure generation by the patient. It's a very tricky job for them to do in the first place and getting a very specific pressure is quite difficult. 
Furthermore, the exact moment of leakage can be quite hard to detect. So to tell the pressure at which leakage occurred is potentially rather unreliable. So we tend to say that uh, if you see leaking at a relatively low pressure, they've got intrinsic sphincter deficiency. 40 centimeters of water is usually used as the sort of cutoff, but we don't have conviction about the reliability or the evidence basis for picking that number. Okay, thank you very much. Now, um, if we go back to DSD, um, there's also a question from Dr. Alma Salamani about whether there's a specific pattern we should be looking for on neurodynamic traces. Well, I think that's the easiest way to diagnose detrusive sphincter dyssynergia. You will see a interrupted flow pattern. So it looks like a peak interruption, peak interruption, and so it goes on. And what you will see in the pressure tr trace, the detrusor pressure and the bladder pressure will actually drop during the flow. So you see a converging and diverging pattern in which the detrusor pressure heads towards the flow curve and then they separate again during interruption. And that's an absolutely characteristic pattern of DSD and dysfunctional voiding. Contrasting with the pattern during straining when both flow and bladder pressure will go up together and in parallel. So that's the pattern of flow of DSD. Okay, thank you. Um, a, if we move over to bladder overactivity now, Dr. Swin, Swinnon has asked, what exactly is the interpretation of stress-induced bladder overactivity and how that may look on the urodynamic trace? So the, the terminology, overactive bladder relates to the symptom of urgency, which may or may be associated with incontinence. It's usually with increased daytime frequency and nocturia. So overactive bladder is what the patient tells you by way of symptoms. Detrusor overactivity is a change in bladder pressure during filling, which may be associated with symptoms, may be associated with incontinence. Now, coughing is an excellent provocation test for provoking stress incontinence, but it can also provoke detrusor overactivity. So, if you see a cough, which is rapidly followed by a phasic rise in detrusor pressure, then that is cough-provoked detrusor overactivity, which may be associated with incontinence. But the point about that is, it is detrusor overactivity. That is the diagnosis. Regardless of the stress provocation, the diagnosis is detrusor overactivity. Okay. And... Dr. Arenas de Silva has asked an interesting, interesting question concerning detrusor overactivity or OAB. Should we stop anticholinergics before testing with urodynamics for these patients? Yeah, so it's one a, a very important question that because it's one that does cause a little bit of concern for some people. We tend to stop the antimuscarinic before the test simply because we want to maximize the chance of reaching a diagnosis for that individual patient. And we've sometimes found that if the patient is still on their antimuscarinic, it could be rather difficult to demonstrate the mechanism under symptoms. However, it's very individual. So for some patients, it might be that you suspect that this is a person with mixed urinary incontinence, that you want to demonstrate the presence of some stress incontinence, but if their bladder is so overactive that you'll find the detrusor pressure all over the place during the test, you might want to stabilize the detrusor to allow visualization of the stress incontinence. So I'd say that for the majority of patients, if you're simply trying to work out what's going on with the overactive bladder, you would stop the antimuscarinic to allow any detrusor overactivity to be seen. But if it's a mixed picture, you might be better staying on the antimuscarinic so that you can establish the full range of problems for that individual. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and we move on to a, a setup question review for Eurodynamics. And Dr. Curell, Curell, sorry, um, asks at what flow rate should we fill the bladder during testing? Yeah, so the um, the range that's generally specified by the Inter International Continent Society is a filling rate of between 10 and 100 mils per minute. 10 would be the requirement for a neuropathic patient. For a non-neuropathic patient, we would generally run at 30 to 50 mils per minute. If we know the bladder capacity is actually rather big based on their bladder diary, then we might run it a little faster, but generally 30 to 50 mils per minute. Okay, thank you. Now, so there's two questions really concerning zeroing to atmosphere, and one question from Dr. Jabbar Newport has asked why this is um, so important, and a, a second question from Dr. Pankaj. Um, no apologies, Dr. Amru is. Could you go over again how to zero to atmosphere? Okay, so the zeroing to atmosphere is basically so that you can uh, ensure that you will detect if there's a problem with pressure recording. So the cough test is an excellent test for being confident that both lines are recording to the same amplitude synchronously. But we sometimes find that one of the lines actually does quite well on the cough test, but they're very different on the resting pressures. And that indicates that there actually is a problem with recording in that line and that you need to attend to it to be accurate. Now, if you've pressed that zero button such that both the bladder and the rectal pressure are showing as zero, then you won't actually detect that there's a problem with one of the lines. So it's all about ensuring that you spot any problems that might be present. So the zeroing to atmosphere, it's a simple, there's a button that you click on the computer screen that simply says zero all lines. And once you click it, then the blue, red, and green lines will drop to zero. And the instruction has to be that the pressure transducer is open to the atmosphere, not to the patient, using the right three-way tap positions to make sure that that zero is done to atmospheric pressure. OK, thank you. Um, we've got one further question about to choose a leak point pressure and a question from Dr. Pangaj asks how this is actually measured in practice. The detrusor leak point pressure is actually a rather different leak point mm -hmm. pressure. That's where the bladder is poorly compliant and the filling is associated with a steady rise in detrusor pressure up until the point where the pressure equals the resistance of the sphincter. That's quite easy to measure because as soon as you see a leak, that's the pressure at which the DLPP is set. Valsalva leak point pressure, well, that's the one where you strain and try and make the patient leak. And that setting the exact value for that is actually really difficult because the precise moment of leakage, that's where you need to detect the pressure. But the rate of change in pressure is so great that it can be very difficult to know exactly the moment of leakage. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid I think that's all, all the questions we've got time for at the moment. Marcus, would you like to um, say a couple of comments to finish? And I'm afraid we've run out of time. Well, I'm extremely grateful for people giving up their evening and participating in this webinar for the questionnaires, sorry, the questions that have been sent in and uh, very grateful to the European School of Urology for the opportunity to share the uh, experience we've had in Bristol. So I encourage everybody to come along to the next ESU webinar to be presented Alex Govorov in June.